Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Waltham City Council Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, this week in the City Council Committee meetings, um, the Committee of the Whole had a lengthy discussion about the issue of taking some land near the new high school site um, to be used as a farm for the new high school, although it seems like maybe it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, in the Public Works and Public Safety Committee meeting, they discussed the resolution to extend the 73 bus. In long-term debt, um, they discussed funding for preserving of documents. In economic and community development, they talked a little about the issue of captioning and recording meetings. And they also discussed the housing resolution um, that Councillor Paz submitted. As in licenses and franchises, they decided to name the field station after Cornelia Warren. So we'll talk about all of those things. I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hi, everyone. And James Critelli's. Hello, everyone. Okay, so starting off with um, the uh, taking of land for farm. So we mentioned this last week that the mayor had asked the council to approve a financing plan and to approve documents taking land um, and assigning that to the school committee. Um, and it appeared that um, this was going to be used for a school, uh, a farm for the school, because the current owner has already turned it into um, a farm and um, wanted to get, sell it to the city for that reason. Um, so it sounded like a great thing. There's lots of good reasons to want a farm for the school. Um, but in this meeting, the committee of the whole had the mayor in to discuss it a little more. And it started to seem like things were a little more complicated. For one thing, um, the current owner of this land bought it about two years ago for $2.2 million. And he is now asking $4.5 million for it. During that time, what he did is he cut down trees and he created a farm that has proven to be sustainable for two years. So that's a big jump in cost. So there seemed to be a story behind why the mayor was buying it at this moment and, and how that price came about. He said that he got quotes um, he got offers uh, from other people who wanted to buy the land. Um, and we didn't necessarily get that whole story. The other thing that came up is though, although the intention is to use this as a farm for the school, there's no money being appropriated, at least not right now, for the school to create a farm program or for maintenance of the farm. Um, what would happen is the current owner has agreed to volunteer for at least two years to train people. So the science department at the school would be responsible for finding ways to use this in their classes. And the farm would be maintained by some combination of the former owner and student volunteers and facility staff from the school. Um, after that, it's possible that the school could use it for an official vocational program, a horticulture vocational program, which would need to be approved by the state. And then there would be a structure to keep the farm. Um, but if that doesn't happen, it's not entirely clear what would happen to the farm. It might um, be used as open space, um, but it also could possibly be used to put a road through or to put a parking lot on or um, to put a stadium. Um, none of those, the mayor said that was not her intention, but the taking documents that she asked the committee to, that, uh, to approve um, didn't put any restriction like that on it. Um, they said it could be used for agricultural or educational use. And it was explained that educational could include pretty much anything the school needed. And that might include a road or a parking lot or a stadium. And um, it wasn't clear why uh, the language didn't exclude that if that wasn't the mayor's intention. Um, so that's another thing that came up. And uh, overall, the councilors had a lot of questions for the mayor, um, and many of them they did not get very clear answers for. And uh, they talked for almost two hours, and it seemed like a lot of things were unanswered. But despite that, they went ahead and approved all three sections of this. So it looks like this will be going ahead. It still officially needs to be approved by the full council, but that will, there's no reason that wouldn't happen. So it looks like the city will be going ahead and getting this land. And um, 
Is that a pretty good summary? I'll go to you, James, first. Uh, did I miss anything? Yeah, that's a that's a fair summary, and the uh, I, I wanted to be optimistic about like the the, the the farm, but like the like you said, the just the complete lack of a plan presented was concerning. The the having it be contingent on interest from students for like the foreseeable long-term maintenance of the thing is kind of concerning too, especially like if we're spending four and a half million dollars on this thing. It's, it's the, the, also just the, the mayor's lack of answering very concrete questions about what the plan is for this thing is also kind of concerning in the fact that it was then voted on and not not unanimously, but voted on and moved forward after that is again concerning. Chris? Yeah, I mean everything in the city is cyclical and um, it a lot of it goes back to just poor city planning and the lack of a city planner and the lack of articulation on the mayor's part of addressing any plan uh, for the city. And so it's very easy to criticize this farm uh, from that angle and counselors very quickly jumped on that. Um, and Josh correctly points out that, uh, you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be a farm. And I think uh, we started, the conversation started with George Darcy uh, being very hesitant about it, which I found, which I thought was interesting because he's always been really a champion of, uh, open space and farmland, um, and it come come to find out that he's taking issue with uh, the wording on the taking uh, and, and how the land can be used, and his attempt to tighten up that language uh, to preserve it just for farming was ultimately defeated, um, and so I mean you know. We talked about this last week. My concern is, you know, uh, is this just going to be another point of entry from the high school because the city realizes that it needs more, um, and but it could turn into anything. Um, and that's and that's it's something nasty about politics is that uh, you can say that you're supportive of something and you can point to like oh, I did this because I'm supportive because I did this, but in reality it could mean something totally different. And so. It's a, it's a nasty game of politics. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think it'd be an awesome thing if, the, you know, the new high school had a horticultural program. Um, but, you know, like a lot of the counselors, I am skeptical of the mayor's intentions. Thanks, yeah. The other thing I should mention that, that um, came out during this hearing is a lot of the motivation for the purchase and the mayor was pretty open about this and it also came out in a line of questioning from uh, Councillor McMenamin was to prevent it from becoming something else. Um, the owner said that he had offers and um, it was pointed out that in theory, this piece of land could be, it, it, the deed comes with the right to build a road through it. So if someone else bought it, they could build a road through it and they could theoretically build up to 11 units of housing. Um, that would require um, city council approving because it's not, it's not zoned for that. But what Councillor McMenamin pointed out was if it was a 40B housing development, they could bypass that. And she wouldn't say the word 40B. She used a euphemism, which was comprehensive permit, because apparently she considers 40B too evil to say. Um, but it was clear that um, a lot of the motivation behind this was preventing it um, from becoming something else. But again, then it wasn't, it still wasn't clear why is it, why aren't we being more specific about saying what it's going to be used for if, if it's an alternative to something else, there's still, and maybe it's worth the money for to use it as open space, but then why not make sure it gets used that way? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, yeah, James, you pointed out that um, in order to start a vocational program, they would have to prove that there's student interest. And the mayor made a very nice speech about how, you know, young people these days understand the importance of this and understand the importance of the environment, which is totally true. But that's a reason to have a farm in your normal program. That's not a reason that people are going to want to do a 
vocational program in horticulture because they may be interested in farming for lots of reasons, but it's still not seen as a good way to make a living. So I think the idea that they're hoping that this will become a successful vocational program and there's really no plan for what will happen if it doesn't, um, that was kind of concerning, even despite she, the fact that I agree with what she said about young people being interested in this. Also, an interesting outgrowth I thought of it ending up with the school is that volunteers to work on this farm would have to go through the school department, which means that they would need to get a background check to work on a farm. So, Councillor Darcy introduced a resolution to change the wording of the taking order so it would specify that it had to be used for open space educational use. And there was a vote on that. It was close, but it failed. And then he turned around and made the motion to accept it the way the, the mayor originally presented it. And then he voted in favor of it. And I believe he had voted in favor of all three, beside, despite being the main person who was at first was raising objections. So can you know Councillor Darcy better? Can you explain why would he why would he say, you know, I, I'm not I don't approve of this? Uh, without a change and then still approve it without a change. I mean, I, uh, I've seen George stand alone on many a vote on his own principles, but um, if I were to guess, uh, you know, he tried his best to do what he wanted, but, you know, on paper, you don't want to seem like the one guy that didn't vote for the farm, although it wasn't unanimous anyway. Uh, but you, he's, he's always been a very, huge champion of open space and, and farmland. So he doesn't want to be seen with the N next to his name uh, in regards to the taking of a farm. It's my guess anyway. Yeah, that's kind of was my guess is that's why most of the counselors ended up voting in favor of this because it's probably going to be a farm. It's probably going to be open space. So why take the risk of being seen as anti-farm or anti-education? But I also thought it was a little embarrassing for the council because they spent, you know, all this time um, asking the mayor questions and she didn't answer most of them and they approved it anyway. So it, it kind of made them look not very relevant as a legislative body. And I kind of understand why they did it because they still want this thing to happen. But I actually respect Councillor LaCava was the only one who voted no on all three. And I think Councillor Vidal voted no on the third one. There may have been other people who voted no, but he was the only one who voted no on all three. And I thought he did the right thing. I don't think he did it because he was anti-farm, but because if, if someone asks you to approve something and you say, I need certain information and they make it very clear that they're you know not interested in providing you that information, and then you say, yes, it kind of undermines things. So I appreciate that he voted no, even though I like the farm idea. James? The, the uh, language changes that Darcy was trying to make were, were narrowly defeated. And it, it was interesting to see the way that that broke. I, I don't have the names off the top of my head, but it, and like, like Council LaCava seemed pretty annoyed with the, the, with the mayor's lack of response on a lot of these things and was one voting against this. But, and I could kind of sympathize with him on that front because it, it was a very reasonable questions to be asking and just not getting responses about like what the plan is for these properties they, they want to just keep the keep the process moving because you're, at, at some point you're just delaying things and making the meeting last longer by voting by being obstructionist on things like that and exactly and there's some balance between being an obstructionist and voting no and just like rubber stamping things you know and that, that seemed to be a technique that the mayor was using a lot is, a, you know, she would answer, when she was asked a question, she would give an answer that didn't totally address the question, but was full of lots of facts about farming and stuff and took a while so that by the time she was done, the counselors ne didn't necessarily feel comfortable asking a follow-up question because it, it was just going on so long. And, you know, She's a lawyer, right? I mean, she was 
she's yeah. basically filibustering her own like thing. <laughs> yeah, filibustering's a good word because there was a one moment where she read the proposal into the record, even though it had already been read into the record. There was another time where she listed off all the departments and city government before saying why she decided to give it to the school. It, there were some times where she was just reading off things that seemed designed to prolong, like someone would do in a filibuster. It, it doesn't really show a lot of respect to like the, both the council. In my in my opinion, it doesn't show a lot of respect to the council, the people there, the people watching, the conduct yourself that way. Honestly. All right, so let's talk about Public Works and Public Safety Committee. We talked last week about the uh, resolution introduced by Councillor Darcy to extend the set, uh, to ask the MBTA to extend the 73 bus through Waltham. And uh, James, can you tell us what happened at this meeting with that? Uh, so there was some uh, discussion back and forth, and the but mostly asking questions around like the 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 effectiveness of asking towns to ask the MBTA to do stuff and like what that would look like. And the the end result was the bill is, or the resolution is staying in that committee and uh, they sent uh, a letter to get approved or to get approved to get sent out to elected officials, uh, state senators and representatives and basically the rest of the neighboring towns saying we want an extension of uh, 73 bus into North Waltham. And uh, there was some discussion about trying to get, um, I believe this would be uh, Colleen uh, Bradley MacArthur would be taking this on, trying to get uh, someone from the MBTA to come to the Public Works Committee to talk about this. And yeah, so that should be appearing in uh, City Council next week for the letter to get sent out. When we talked to Christine last week, she thought it would be likely that they would either need to do a survey or do a pilot program to prove interest in this. Was there any discussion of, of either of those tactics? There was some discussion of it. Um, and they, uh, I think Colleen had brought up that there's actually like an MBTA better bus program that they're trying to do uh, that is supposed to be uh, superseding the need for individual locales to do their own pilot programs and to be able to just engage with. And that's, I guess, the thing that she would be engaging with to try to bring them into our uh, public works meeting to see if what, what can be done, like what could be done there. I, I'm not sure how effective that will be, but mm -hmm. I think that's the, the tack that they're taking. Yeah, I mean, we keep talking about like uh, pilot programs and things like that, but we're not even close to there yet we need to even get the MBTA's attention. And so George is trying this new tactic of trying to go through the state representatives and other cities to hopefully they can join in on the cause. Um, and we'll see if it works. I, I, uh, I've never, you know, organized in that way. So I have no idea what the prospects are. Uh, Chris, you were at the long-term debt committee meeting. Can you tell us what happened there? Uh, yeah, the long-term debt committee had a, uh, I don't know, interesting to some people. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the city use, is using, is proposing to use CPA money, which is uh, uh, public money um, that anyone can use uh, to catalog all of our historical documents that the city has. And these are, you know, documents from like the 1600s. Uh, and what's interesting is that it's costing the city $3 million dollars to just inventory what we have. It's not to, you know, figure out the best way to preserve it. It's not the actual preservation of it, but just to catalog all of our historical documents, it's gonna cost $3 million. And no one really asked any questions about like, could we do this cheaper? Um, so, I mean, frugality uh, reigns again, but. Interesting. I have mixed feelings about this because I think preserving documents, especially 1600s, is really important. But $3 million to just to inventory it seems really high, especially when you consider that CPC funds can be also be used for affordable housing um, or for open space. Um, that's a lot of money to spend on documents. James, did you have something to add? I, yeah, I was going to actually say exactly what you said, which is that like basically the CPC funds seem to get used in the order of parks and open space, then documents, and then maybe, maybe not affordable housing. 
in terms of order yeah. operations. Yeah, it would be interesting. Um, I saw a, a, a pie chart, but that, that was about two years ago. It would be interesting to get an updated pie chart. But yeah, it seems like there's a minimum amount of your CPC money that has to go to housing, and that's about what we put towards it as the minimum. Um, and But that's two years ago, so maybe changed since then. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the... Uh, Economic and Community Development Committee meeting, um, where there was some discussion of the captioning and recording of meetings. Chris, can you fill us in on that? Yeah, this is moving forward. Um, I believe the end result was that the city council is looking to approve $70,000 um, to give to local access. And they're saying that it costs this much money to upgrade their server to uh to withstand the bandwidth of 26 meetings a year or something um which just seems so irrationally high but uh it also in that in that seventy thousand dollars includes nine thousand dollars for closed captioning so they are moving ahead with doing it themselves um and that is good news um and so to the best of my knowledge i think the city council next week is going to approve the money to do that and then local and then the local access station will have that money and they need to do the thing uh, that we paid them to do. So I think next week, this should be mostly done. Meaning they're gonna approve it in full council and then it's a done deal. Yeah. Any, any guess on when they'll implement it? No, I have no idea. I have no idea how long those things take, but I don't think the city council has to do anything else after that. I don't think they have to approve any more things unless they come back and say they need more money to maybe another $20,000 to record another hour of a meeting or something. James, did you have something to add? Well, no, I was going to say uh, it would be good to find out when we get put out of a job. Oh, yeah, that's true. At some point, <laughs> we, we won't rely, the whole city won't rely on James and Chris um, to uh, record these meetings. That's great. So that's all good news. I mean, I have I have two things to say about the price. Yes, it sounds very high. On the one hand, that happens with media technology. Sometimes the price of updating your established system is way higher than you'd expect based on. So for example, at my work, I have a very fancy video conference room. If it were to break down, it would cost like two, $3,000 to fix. And my boss would say, why would I spend two, $3,000 when we can do Zoom for free? But the answer is it's two different things. It's, a, it's an older technology and it costs more. So that's probably why their costs are so high that those are the real costs in their established systems. But the other side of it is, you know, when they were asking um, the CAC director about that, the budget, projections in a in a the quote she gave them basically in a previous meeting when they asked her about the number for the captioning she said something like well that's an additional thing we have to do where she wasn't really explaining why it costs that much she was more explaining why she wasn't sure they should have to do it so that's what prevents me from totally giving her the benefit of the doubt about these numbers because it kind she kind of hinted that she might be basing the number on how much she wanted to do it if that makes sense yeah i mean we know the number is like 26 meetings a year um and uh i mean they said it was nine thousand dollars so let's do some quick math here uh it would cost 350 dollars to caption every single one of those meetings that actually doesn't seem uh un totally unreasonable and assuming they're human check captions, if they're paying that much for an automated service, that's they are. They, it is automated. It is completely automated. It's software. Yeah, this is the software one. So it is automated. Yeah. Three fifty per meeting. Three hundred fifty dollars per meeting for automated captions. Yeah. Okay. We're doing Maybe it for we need free. To do We're getting something. ripped off. But I'm really happy it's happening. <laughs> I'm really happy yeah. it's happening, but I don't understand that cost. Yeah, that's that's kind of strange. Um, and the other thing, so thank you. The other thing that happened at that meeting was uh, Councillor Paz's resolution having to do with housing got discussed. So Chris, can you also fill us in on that one? Yeah, and James, jump in here uh, whenever uh, you have input, um, but... 
Um, so PAS has a housing resolution that is looking to benefit landlords, tenants, and homeowners. And it's very incredibly vague. Um, it's really just a chance to have people talk. Um, and that's exactly what happened today. Um, I forget the guy's first name, Waters from Housing was in to talk about, um, you know, from the city side, like how many evictions are taking place, how much ho housing relief um, was given during COVID. Um, and then Watch, uh, a really cool organization that does uh, housing work, came in and talked about the plight of uh, tenants um, right now and what that situation is like. Um, you know, I, I thought it was an interesting thing. You know, nothing was decided on. There was very few uh, asks made, um, and we can get to that in a second. But I mean, some interesting points were uh, the housing relief, the rent relief uh, that the city of Waltham was doing during COVID helped 610 families. Um, and I forget the numbers, millions, um, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm happy about 610 families. Um, you know, the food pantry that I work for sees 700 Waltham residents every single time. So, you know, there's plenty more uh, people struggling in Waltham than 610, but I'm happy that those 610 people uh, were helped. Kathleen McMiniman brought up the fact that according to city data, there were more evictions on the north side of the river than the south side. And that was very interesting there because, you know, the talking points are always at the south side of seeing more. Um, what I thought was missing there was, you know, there's very little data for um, people that get notices to quit and then, or an intimidating intimidation from landlords. And then they just have to leave because they don't want any trouble, you know. Uh, um, James, you want to jump in? Oh, yeah, yeah. I watched it also at that point. I think somewhere following up on that, it mentioned that the, a lot of the issue is just in lack of information from tenants. And mm -hmm. like the, out of the like hundreds of houses that they uh, help a year with impending evictions, many of those also have like multiple families in those houses. Mm -hmm. And there's, they, which is also ties into some of the stuff we talked about two weeks ago uh, with the college students and more than four uh, unrelated people in a building and the uh, person uh, from housing, I believe, that was talking about that then, bringing up that uh, if you try to enforce, you can enforce something like that against students, but you, it's a lot more difficult enforcing it against families that may be somewhat financially tenuous and difficult to, de to de determine who are, is or isn't related living in the same yeah. building. Yeah, I mean, um, much, yeah, what brought up that a lot of the families that they serve, there's like three, four families living in a two bedroom apartment. And we're talking about families. And that's exactly what was brought up. Uh, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. The fact that, you know, we can try and legislate students, but, you know, it's a slippery slope and you have to, you have to apply the law everywhere. And, you know, there are a lot of people struggling in Walton, and there are a lot of people that will adapt to subpar living conditions just to get by. And that's what, that's what a lot of happened. Um, that was a little, talked about a lot. Um, I mean, it was disappointing that nothing really happened. Uh, there were two asks being made. Um, and James, you want to talk a little bit about one? I, I think you found that one interesting. Oh uh, yeah. That, I think it was uh, Randy, uh, the counselor LeBlanc mm -hmm. brought up uh, determining how many affordable units like affordable rental units have been lost to sort of luxury housing construction in the last decade and wanted to get a he wanted to get like a concrete number on that from actually, it wasn't clear how that's going to the numbers be coming i think it's was it i think it might have been passed to take that on or whichever that was like one of the outcomes of that initial thing that was trying to figure yeah. out that Hopefully, yeah, hopefully something interesting comes with that. Um, and who knows when that data is going to come. Um, and then the other one was for, for Watch and uh, Paz asked to have five instances of intimidation by landlords from tenants, uh, which just seems kind of vague and anecdotal. Um, hopefully it's useful for some reason. You know, I was hoping for something, you know, to be uh brought up watch brought up the fact that they have uh, an ordinance that they've already drafted um that would give all of the information about resources and rights to everyone that gets a notice to quit um 
and That's, that yeah. that, resol- that that ordinance that they have drafted up has no sponsor. It is not in the city council. Um, so why aren't we talking about that? And it's just you know the, the city council takes a long time to do anything uh, important. The bureaucracy of the local government is very slow, unless they don't. Unless it's something that they don't like. Uh, we'll bring up an example of something uh, recently. Um, I'm going to share my screen. There is a uh, Instagram account that uh, got erected and uh, gained traction. Uh, Gorilla Gardeners of Waltham, um, a group of people put uh, six garden beds on the intersection of Highland and Curtis and with the intention of just giving away all of the produce and it just becoming a community garden. And in 24 hours, the city took it all apart, um, just completely dismantled. Um, and so, I mean, the city council can move quickly. The city can move fast, uh, but not for things that I find enjoyable. And to tie this back to the discussion we were just having about the city buying a farm with no clear plan on what they were going to be doing with it or anything like that <laughs> and also having bar- barriers to entry for the public to even use it is interesting related to that thank you for that background and actually just to add on to what james said there was sort of an odd moment in the discussion of um the uh taking of the farmland where it came up that in order to, for anybody to be involved in the farm during school hours, they'd have to be quarry checked. And uh, Councillor Vidal made a comment about, oh yes, of course we wouldn't want unqualified people planting flowers. And it wasn't clear if he was being sarcastic, but it was very interesting that came up <laughs> at the same time as uh, this other issue. But I wanted to just bring, go back to one thing because it's really important and that's the ordinance you mentioned that watch drafted. Um, so if your landlord decides to sell the place you live to someone else and they want to flip it or they want, they just want you out, they give you a 30 day notice to leave. And in fact, you don't in most cases have to leave within 30 days. There are ways that you can challenge it and Massachusetts actually has a good system for for tenants. But most people don't know that, especially if they're, you know, they don't speak the language well or they're new to the area. Um, So this is a ordinance that would, all it would require is that everybody knows what the rules are and knows what the options are. So I think that's really important. And I hope that they're able to find a counselor to uh, bring that forward because that seems pretty important. I, I completely agree on this. And especially now, like with eviction, like restrictions ending and the housing market having done what it did post COVID, through COVID, now people are getting you know rent increases that are like you know four or five hundred dollars a month and are going to be getting notices to quit. Things like this are very important. And if your landlord tells you you have to move out, if you don't pay them, you know this massive rent increase, you don't necessarily have to. When they say to, there's options available to you. And finally, we have licenses and franchises. James, can you tell us what happened there? Oh yeah, just a the uh, not not very much uh, exciting on the docket. Uh, but off the docket, there was uh, the, the mayor came in to uh, do a, a, a renaming of the uh, field station to the Cornelia Warren Field Station. And uh, Cornelia Warren is like a local philanthropist. Uh, did a lot of work with. In, it did a lot of work in the city and also uh, farm properties in the city. So yeah, that was interesting. That, to see. that sounds like good news. And I'd like to ask Chris for a little more background on Cornelia Warren, but he seems he had to leave already. But that's good because we're done with what we have to talk about. Thank you very much, James. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and we'll be back next week with the full city council meeting. Bye, everyone. <laughs>